Welcome back to this Elado Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Professor Anthony Killer, Professor of Strategy and Development and Institute Director at the Commonwealth Institute of Advanced and Professional Studies, and Chiku Gia, former Commissioner for Information, Data State, and Managing Director at Mark Foley Hospitality uh, Limited. Well, gentlemen, thank you again uh, for showing up. <laughs> Good to be here. Well, making sure you are here. But today we have discussed two major policy issues. Yes. Crude oil theft and how to deal with it. And we have two experts, one from the professional technical end, the other from the maritime sector who was a navigator, you know. And then we discussed food security, yeah. represented by a major player in that axis, managing director, CEO, uh, New Holdings and Chairman of the Silos uh, Concessionaires Association of Nigeria. But let's start with uh, crude oil theft and latest developments in that regard. And I would like to start with uh, Chiki Ogia, who is likely to say, well, some of the oil being stolen, you know, <laughs> got, got made away with from his uh, ancestors' backyard. <laughs> I, and I he's back at it as well. I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 I never look at those issues that way. But um, okay. seriously, yeah, I listened to all the discussions this afternoon and um, everything they were all saying tied into each other. You know, when you talk about food security, I think the most important thing you need there is, you know, the farmers, the fishermen, those that produce this food for us to eat, are they even safe? To go into the business of producing the food, if they cannot go to their farms, how will there be food? Why would food not be scarce? And once we all know, once any commodity is scarce, the price goes up. But the the aspect of it, which you said you wanted to start with, which is the oil theft, you know, that has been with us forever. We know. But what I did not understand, and again, that tells about you know our story in Nigeria. Everything we do. You know, it all calls back to what I call elite conspiracy, so to speak. Otherwise, if you get a vessel on the sea that is trying to bunker that amount of crude, why on earth do you destroy it? And even add to the pollution in the sea? Do you know what it is for all that crude to go into the water? And we are talking about food security. What happens to the fish and the marine life and everything that is there? What happens to the people that live in all those places? Because I know that place. I remember when in, um, was it 2013 or 14, I remember when we had that terrible flood in, in um, Delta State. Okay. And I was the commissioner for information. And I went extensively to those riverine areas in the Ijo areas. My God, you'll be surprised. You'll see people living on water. The greatest commodity in those areas it's are water. land. You don't find land. People, until I got that, that they didn't realize you could build a house on water. Absolutely. I'm telling you. Yeah. People live on water. You know, being bound by a sea and the ocean. And there's just a little strip in between. So what I'm trying to say is that, but if they did not do that, and they investigated that vessel, you'll be surprised where all the hands on <laughs> will be pointing to as the people behind it. Because like we all know, crude oil theft is not something refrats do. It's not something refrats do. It's, it's a cost-intensive thing. Someone provided that vessel. In fact, from what we hear, that vessel has been in and out of Nigerian waters for God knows how many years. 12 years. Uh -huh. And they've been changing color and doing all kinds of things. So those exactly are my issues about that. But be that as it may, you know, from what the other guy said, you can tell, he talked about the long, the medium. I mean, that's exactly what Dele Alake was saying. Uh, they, will, they will start providing um, uh, storage for these facilities, which is good, which is because we all know how we see these beautiful tomatoes and all that coming from the north. And before they even get to the south, they are all spoiled. They are all rotten. We don't have those storage. So government wants to you know, intervene in those areas work with the private sector, as um, the last guest said, keep those foods under storage, and then bring them out as and when required. And that way they can control the market. And he also spoke about taking one crop at a time so that we don't do everything at the same time. You know, if it's rice or soya beans, like he said, those ones that have 
multiplier effects. Soya beans, he says, will also impact on the poultry because those are the things you use, maize, to, 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 to feed um, uh, chickens and all that, you know, so there'll be a multiplier effect and all that. So to my mind, like he also said, and everybody's saying, well thought out program, but what is the execution? We always know that is the situation with Nigeria. How we execute these issues are what we should be looking at. Uh, they talked about commodity boards, National Grain Reserve. Mm -hmm. Those are things that have been with us for so many years. So if, like I said, the workability of these things are exactly what we need. And finally, they talked about domiciling this whole initiative under the office of the NSA, which is a good thing. I mean, the NSA is a very, very sophisticated office. Have you seen the latest office they have, the kind of gadgets that are in there? So if they can deploy those kind of things and they're able to solve uh, the great surveillance all over our farms and farmers are beginning to feel safer and they can go back to work, that will help us. And what you want to see, which is the bottom line, which is what the average Nigerian wants to see, is a drop in the price. Not all this long talk and big English, we are all speaking on TV. We want to see the prices of these commodities come down. I can finish. Well, uh, Professor Kila, I, mean, I like particularly the point Chiki Ogea made about the connection between crude oil theft and food security. Yes. And I linked the destruction of the vessel, which happens again and again, again yeah. to the fact that, look, you even, you want to do food security. <laughs> you deny the same people you are trying to protect, to protect you yeah. know, <laughs> from having access to marine uh, resources, you know. But what's your take on the two sides? Well, I, I agree with the, you know, with the, with the nexus between these three elements, and I think that's a very good way of looking at it. My take is that the management of the transfer, the theft, and um, you know the the, um, the economic damage of crude oil in Nigeria is an indictment of governance, not government of governance in itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for two major reasons. Number one is that, as Jiko Gia rightly points out, the crude oil market is a very sophisticated, very niche very selective market. It is less than 0.1% of Nigerians that are involved in it. But it affects over 90% of Nigerians. So in between less than 0.1 and above 90% lies the government. If the government cannot stop less than 0.1 from harming over 90%, then we have a problem of governance. It's a huge problem we have because it is crude oil that is being stolen. You don't sell crude oil to fry Akara, anything. You have to refine it or you export it. It's not, it's not something you can just take or do. The number of people, and I want our viewers at home to look at their children or their spouses or anybody that is um, watching this program with them, to ask themselves, if they were given a card today to go into the oil and gas sector, would they even know what to do inside there? It's a very technical, very reserved sector. So really, if the government decides to investigate every Nigerian involved in oil and gas sector, it is not a big exercise because there are less than 500,000 people involved in the oil sector in Nigeria, at least at the top level. So for them to identify those who are either stealing, transporting, buying, refining, or exporting is not a major or, or task to do. Or falsifying the data. Or falsifying the data as well. It, it's not a major task to do. So I think, really, that, and that's why I call it an indictment of governance. If governors really want to sit up, they need a room less than our studio to sit down and with some laptops to say, okay, let's identify all those involved and let's see what their roles are. And let's see the roots of theft, of transportation, of refining, of data, and then trace it from there. It's not a difficult forensic audit if people are really interested in doing it. And I think that, that's a very crucial thing I think thing the to problem know. is where it will get back to. That obviously well, we need to make up our mind because if we keep, so yeah, you're right. I you know, know that the, we can take that. So, the, the, you know, the famous when you point a finger, yeah. where are the less four yeah. fingers pointing That's to? Right. But we, the people, That's then need to make up our mind. You know, if we want this thing to continue or we don't want it to continue, that is where we need to. So that makes sense. On the food issue, well, you cannot fault the intention of the government, and I think this government is, you know, is really chasing and getting headlines. You know, the, this idea of saying we declare for the emergency, it sounds good. You can't fault that intention. But I have some reservation on the method because this idea of saying we're not going to release this, release that, 
is a good idea, but you see, the world has gone beyond that. The new world, in thinking in terms of efficiency, the key word I'm not hearing there is the private involvement. You see, what you need to be saying is that, as from today, because of this emergency, we're going to facilitate individuals and companies and organizations that are interested in storage system. We're going to invite 1,000 logistic Mr. companies. Mr. Yes. talked about private sector yes, he said the most involvement. involvement. Mr. Aneku yes. is not the government. Yes. Yes. He, he a, talked about private sector. Yes. He did, which is yes. a good thing. But the yes. point is that he's not in government. He's yeah. like me, yeah. saying what government should be doing. Yeah. I would want government to say more of that, to say, let us get in those who are already in that job or those who are intending to go into that job and say, we're going to pull away whatever has been hindering you. So that the tomatoes that come from Kano or from the Middle Belt to Lagos, I think of Lagos, I stay in Lagos, that arrives here, it will arrive fresh and good. And that way, we increase supply and we affect demand. Because what we are not realizing at the moment, from what is being said, because by the way, when this reason was said two or three years ago, people were faltering data. When they said the food security was an issue in Nigeria, what we are not realizing is that the government is admitting, and rightly so, that the problem we have is not just the price of food, but actually security of life that is linked to food. It's not just a market issue. We're now turning to health issue, we're turning to defense issue, sustainability issue. It has really become a matter of livelihood. To that extent, the way to deal with it is not the usual fertilizer matter. It's good, but I think we need to push more. We, we need a quantum leap in dealing with this. You cannot be more correct, Professor Killer. <laughs> After all, we are told that this matter of security is multi-dimensional. Multi right. yeah. It's not just about food security. It's yeah, health security. Right. It's about addressing poverty and all of that. So that. there is an interconnectedness. Absolutely. Which we hope that the policymakers will be able to figure out. You know. Anyway, let's take this other very important uh, subject. The National Assembly has approved the $800 million World Bank loan request for the federal government to deal with the effects of the scrapping of fuel subsidy. It has now emerged that President Bola Tinubu plans to pay 8,000 naira a month to 12 million poor and low-income households for six months. A rise correspondent, Omo Bazuaye, reports that Parliament also permitted the President to convert another 500 billion naira from his supplementary budget initially approved for 2022 for the same purpose. Here is Bazuaye's report. Two months after the Ninth National Assembly refused to approve the $800 million World Bank loan for former President Mohamed Buhari, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu resubmitted the same request to the 10th Senate to cushion the impact of its full subsidy removal. Buhari had sent the loan request to the National Assembly with barely 19 days to the end of his administration, but the lawmakers failed to act on it before the end of their legislative tenure in June. According to Tinubu, the disbursement of the loan is to provide safety net for vulnerable Nigerians. And to ensure the transparency of the process, Tinubu in a letter read by the President of the Senate, Goswami Lapabi, on the floor, said digital transfers were made directly to beneficiaries' accounts and mobile wallets. Approval of the request of Mr. President has been granted by the Senate yes. and, and will now be communicated to him. The program, which is expected to stimulate economic activities in the informal sector, improve nutrition, health and education, targets at least 12 million poor Nigerians as beneficiaries. Tinambu, on his inauguration day, announced the removal of first subsidy, a burden he said government can no longer carry. In the same vein, the president requested the National Assembly to allow him to convert another 500 billion naira from the 819 supplementary budget for 2022 to alleviate the effects of subsidy removal policy. The president could not withdraw the money from the service-wide vote and could also not forward a fresh supplementary budget of his own as he was yet to constitute his cabinet. The palliative component of that particular bill was 500 billion. That is to cushion the impact of the oil subsidy. Because you know, Mr. President, from what we understood, 
believe that we can delay gratification for a greater gain tomorrow. And it is to this extent the president looked into this document and agreed that the supplementary budget of 819 be amended to take care of some of these palliatives. And as such, he went to the document and reordered. And that was where this said 500 billion is coming from. The sum of 185 billion is to be channeled to the Ministry of Works and Housing to alleviate the impact of severe flooding experienced in the country. Okay. President Chinobu palliatives for subsidy. The 800 uh, uh, billion promised by the uh, World Bank. There's another 500 uh, promised by the um, IMF. There is a 400 billion uh, savings. There's also the uh, extraction from the 2022 Supplementary Act out of 819. The government wants. Now, all these monies, Nigerians are saying, what are you going to do with the money? The government has told us that, oh, there will be, a, you know, um, money provided for conditional cash transfer. But it won't be like the one they did under Buhari. Some people are saying, we don't trust that. Some people are saying, we want the granular details. How is this money to be spent? In fact, some people are saying, give me my own share. Who are these uh, 12 million people? that you are talking about, nobody knows what is inside the social register. But I know, uh, uh, Professor Killer, you don't qualify for this poor and vulnerable also, uh, given your outlook and your achievements in life. Uh, <laughs> Chike, he, Nigeria has been so kind to Chike Ogea. He's robust outlook. <laughs> Like, yeah, has been so kind to Chico here. Yeah. He's managing this, he's managing yeah. that. <laughs> Nobody is going to give you 8,000 <laughs> But how do we manage this for the benefit of Nigerians? Because some people are saying they will steal our money home. <laughs> and we don't want that. I think it's a pity we're having this kind of conversation. You know, let us start by saying, you know, the, the, the intention of the government is good. There's no doubt. You know, like the ones that left. These ones are aware that there's a problem in town and they want to fix the problem. So that's a good thing. I am not impressed by the solution, you know, to put it mildly but clearly, because in a situation where you have um, increase in prices and you have reduction in availability of goods and services, throwing more money to the um, consumers is not the solution at best. They say, what are they going to do the money? They say they're going to share it with people. They're going to share it with people so that we have the same amount of goods or less. And I want viewers to follow me. We have the same amount of goods or less in the market, then we have more money for it. At least, you know, 18,000 naira more, 8,000 naira more. So it will drive up inflation. It's going to drive up the price. It doesn't make sense. And the money thrown there technically will be swallowed in the dark, ugly tunnel of inflation. My view that what needs to be done is to take that money and to throw it at production. So that that way, you increase supply, reduce price, and you also create employment. Now, this might be, for some people, an ideological position, but I want people to trust me that I hold this position very there, not because I'm against the government position, but because I believe, and experience has shown that every time we've thrown money out, it either comes to by inflation, or some people steal it, as they've rightly said. So I, I do not believe in this, but it makes the government look good, and I think, and, and I have doubt about this governance of paternalistic, philanthropic, solution to our problem. Mm -hmm. It does not build it's institution. It's called capitalism. <laughs> that is not capitalism. This is really? paternalistic and philanthropical. It is something else. This is, you know, a Baba, Baba helping, it's Babaism. It's Baba helping government. <laughs> we want a government where people can live, learn, trade, love, based on their abilities, and the government does not hinder them. And I, and I stopped there. Well, okay. capitalism is you take the big pie, yes. and then you at least give the small people a small part of it. We do not, it so is that not everybody the, can feel good. It well, is not the goodness of the butcher or the goodness of the baker that gives us our bread or our loaf. It is everybody following their self-interest in a legitimate, a transparent quote. way. I'm trying to remember the Adam Smith. Smith. <laughs> Adam Smith. <laughs> Adam Smith. Yeah, yeah quite well, right. Well, yes. well, 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 um, Prof almost said it all. You know, like one old advert, I think for the Santana car we used to drive a long time ago. He used to talk about there's nothing more Much to add. Bad. You know, but the truth is this. 
whenever we talk about sharing money and putting money into people, poor people, yeah. like you rightly said, it brings up, it throws up so much. Who are those poor people? Are they the ones in Lekki that live in um, those, those places, islands yeah. that don't, you know, that just live on the streets yeah. and in find shelters it. and in shanties and, you know, or is it the poor man in Agege that lives in uh, Face Me, I Face You? And all? You know, I don't know how they are going to come with that this, um, register. With that register, that's number one. Number two, like you said, of course, throwing money at these people will only have the net effect of driving up inflation. So that doesn't solve, that doesn't solve the problem. I saw somewhere where some people preferred what looked like a very simple solution, but it made a lot of sense to me. They said, take that money and go and and turn around our refineries and mm, then exactly. when we start producing crude oil in nigeria yeah. the price of crude oil will crude come oil down increase the supply so increase the supply just like yeah. you said yeah. put the money in productive ventures yes, put into production and that's what people are saying and if you ask me i am a bit excited you know and this might be my first bubble being blown and i hope not i was always ex uh, excited because i know what tinubu did in lagos i've never been in the apc you know, but I, when you see what is yeah, right, no, 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 I've left politics. I'm not in politics. So when you see what is good, it is good. And I thought that that was the few thinking centers of the sub, sub national government Nigeria ever had. Because I live here and I've seen the difference. I live here and I've been to all the other states in Nigeria. And I see the difference of what thinking can do here in Lagos. Now, Tinubu is in Abuja with basically that crowd from Lagos helping and assisting him. And I want to see that kind of thinking going to what they want to do the next. The only person missing they, there they, is Ruben Abati. <laughs> <laughs> because they have to show us that that genius they had in Lagos is still there. And I never knew they said they were doing any register of push dashing uh, uh, money in Lagos, uh, in there quotes, you go. Giving up money to... The, in the spirit of Vassarov. That we don't know who we are. Is anyway, it? that's true. You know, Ruben is that, said that, it, that, 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 that when you get into that place, that gets into you. So all kinds of afflictions. Things <laughs> coming up to you. So yeah. please, that's what I would say. I think some more thought has to be got, put into that before they start sharing that money. Oh, yeah. Let them put that money into things that can begin to turn our economy around. That is better than giving out handouts to people. Okay, please. gentlemen, let's take one more subject. But this subject, I don't know... Uh, you have to declare your bona fide because it has to do with the UK. <laughs> I know you go there and you have children there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have children anymore. Oh, they are all not doctors. They are all yeah, married. Yeah, grandma, married. Yeah. Yeah, so. Anyway, yes, many Nigerian students are facing tough times in the United Kingdom after the Naira equivalent of their tuition fees increased by over 60% following the recent move by the Central Bank of Nigeria to unify the nation's foreign exchange rates. About two weeks ago, after President Bola Tinubu promised to unify the nation's multiple exchange rates, the APS Bank decided to float the Naira at the investors' and exporters' window of the foreign exchange market. Since then, the Naira has fallen from 471 to the dollar to 750 per dollar and even higher, and 589 per pound to 957 per pound. This has led to about 60% increase in tuition fees for students in the United Kingdom. This rise in exchange rate has put more pressure on many Nigerian schooling in the UK and beyond. The United Kingdom is one of the destinations of choice for many Nigerians, as many as 128,770 Nigerian students enrolled in universities in the United Kingdom between 2015 and 2022. The other part of the problem, as we saw during the week, is that uh, Rishi Sunak, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, and also uh, Andrew Bailey. Yeah. There seems to be a meeting of minds yeah. that uh, public sector pay will be increased Let's get from between 5% for yeah. nurses to 65 mm. for teachers to 7% for police and prison workers and all of that. And they are saying that it's immigrants that will pay for it. Yeah, why not? So that's another geopathy yeah. for Nigerian uh, students. So, uh, Chika, I wanted to ask you, because I imagine that you still have children <laughs> no, in yeah, UK yeah. universities. You see, you see when, I was in that, when I was in that business, uh, Ruben, many years ago, I think the highest I ever changed money yeah. to, to, to... By the way, I got all my first class education in Nigeria. So you can see that there is a gradual Decline, and continuous decline in 
education. Well, because I did not understand why my children could not have gone to my alma mater, which I'm so proud of. I keep telling them. Exactly. Which village school is that? Right? Yeah, I went to the best and the only university in the village school. University of Lagos. Now you people shout in Malabar. <laughs> you don't do things like that. <laughs> right? So the truth is that uh, <laughs> I, I think I was have paid about 180 something or 140 something like that to change to the pound at that time. So the truth, I really feel sorry for the people with the young children you know, that have to deal with what is going on now. So why do we now not use this opportunity, which is part of tying to yeah. all the Fix discussions we're talking about, fix our education system. When we were going to school, Ruben, you know now, we were at the same category of schools with the University of London colleges. It was just those two Ivy League universities, uh, and you all had Cambridge and age. Oxford, that were on their own. But the other first-class universities, Warwick, you name it, you know, all, everything, you know, LSC, Queen Mary, all those, all those schools. They were at par with at least those seven initial universities, the five major ones, and then later on, I think you Malabites, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they crashed into the matter and maybe University of Joss. Yeah, you know, so that I think is what we need to do. Not well, I think, I, don't, I, don't well, well, I think you say it's what we need to do. Now, uh, what we have to do, you were saying, now we are forced to do it because, you know, in reality, this is not sustainable. The data we saw there of almost 200,000 people um, Nigerians studying abroad between 2015 to 2019 is not a correct data, alarming as it is, because in reality, that's that counts only people who have Nigerian passports. There are a lot of children who own double passports uh -huh. and Nigerians. So when you do that, mm. the data is likely to go up, you know, because I do, this is my industry. That, that's right. I look at it every day. It's a problem we have because we have neglected our institutions, because ASU is on strike, because education is not good, and because, quite frankly, Nigerian elite does not trust and value education. And this is the price they're paying for it. Education in, education in the world is an industry. We see it that way. Not only of solving problems, but also generating revenue. Because there was a time in this country in the 70s and the mid-80s when people traveled to Nigeria from neighboring African countries right. to come and study in Nigeria. We've lost that. There's nothing stopping us from going back even to that point America. again. from America. And there's something I need to say. Regardless of what people say, this is a very harsh thing. Unpopular to say, and I get it because of people's pain. But we must commend the government for unifying this window. You see, besides the economics, we don't think about it. There's something wrong in subsidizing the rich by giving them an, a, a special window to pay for the school fees of their children abroad. Especially when these rich are also the elite that neglect education in Nigeria. What will need to happen here is that if we're all stuck in this situation, when people cannot afford it anymore, maybe we'll be forced yes. to make our education system work That's and right. get more respect for professors, especially if they have hair I agree with you. To I agree. Especially if they have hair on their head. I agree with you. To, to both of you, a professor, I can't tell you what you say. Who is in our world today? You cannot be more correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati from my entire team here in Lagos. It's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. <laughs>